How many of you are like uh, already been developers and right now not being developers or like still developers? That's quite a huge number of them. So pro probably like uh, many of you will understand uh, some of the things that I'm going to say. <laughs> it doesn't mean that others don't understand. I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. So I was say like a uh, uh, cool, happy developer for 12 years. That didn't mean like, uh, uh, so till I got a phone call from a company. And it didn't mean that after the phone call, it became, I became a sad developer. I just changed my roles. So I got this phone call from a company. And then they said, uh, hey, your profile looks very interesting for us. And you want to have a chat with our manager. And then I said, like, what's the role? They said, management. I think I'm not interested. But they said, like, can you have this chat with a, a person? And then you can take a decision. So it's like not very curious to have the chat, but uh, since they asked like a couple of times, and then said, yeah, let's go for it. So I went for the conversation with the, uh, he was the director of uh, India for a particular company, uh, which was like having eight distributed offices. At that point, uh, when I came in uh, and then he had a chat, he asked me like, uh, this this kind of role, and are you interested in all those things? I said, I'm being very happy doing what I'm doing. Uh, I'm not really excited about the role that you're talking about. Then he said, what are you, what are you very interested about? Or uh, why are you liking the present job? I said, I'm building distributed systems. I'm working with the things at scale. I really like that. Then he said, what is your, the maximum number of team members that you ever work with? I said, like, I am a tech lead for a team which was around size of 15. Then he said, I'm talking about a team of 200 people. Doesn't that mean like people at scale? And I said, like, sounds interesting. Uh, but how do you think I can help you? He said, you have worked on distributed systems. Just apply the same principles to people. Then I said, it won't work like that. Then he asked, why? Then I said, because people have feelings. Then he said, OK, <laughs> uh, that's why we are hiring you. You are not hiring any mission or like a framework. So overall, the conversation was uh, interesting enough that I joined them and wanted to really try the role. And it was one of the initial thought process during which I had the same kind of concepts, some of which I also adopted from distributed systems and applied to teams. So when anybody is speaking in a stage, even especially in the QCon when I was seeing there are two people talking. One is like, especially when they're using slides, uh, one is the person who is actually talking like me, and the other one is like uh, the person who is actually talking the slides, like literally the slides moving around. So what I did was like, uh, let us put a character to the slides, and that's Craig. <laughs> How many of you are, uh, okay, can you guess uh, which place is Craig from? Australia, good. So he said, like, just put uh, good day, mate, and then they'll know. So I said, uh, maybe not. So he said, give it a shot. So he's true. <laughs> he's correct, actually. Uh, how many of you are from Ireland or like Irish? Not much. OK. <laughs> so more than a decade ago, I used to work with a company, uh, an Irish company, which had an offshore development center in India. Couple of the tech leads, they came uh, to our uh, uh, development center there. And in the evening, we all went for drinks. And a couple of drinks, and then like, OK, eventually it went for more than a couple of drinks. But one thing I observed, which was very, very common, was over the whole conversations, one pattern was repeating. A lot of our uh, Indian developers were speaking something and then trying to tell some joke. And they're like uh, Irish people telling their jokes. When they say the joke, both of them laugh out loud, and some of us laugh. And when we say the joke, they were not actually laughing, but they smile and then say it's funny. So what I understood is, whenever there is a distributed team, and there are only two things that can happen to your joke. Either people laugh, or they say it's funny. So when you laugh, I understand it's a joke. <laughs> when you don't, I understand it's funny. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> Craig thinks it's funny. I'll switch off Craig for a minute, and uh, let's do the talking. So when uh, one of the things uh, most important in distributed teams is uh, a lot of times we see things at uh, macro level, and then see things are like all good, but we don't think uh, uh, see things at a micro level. And if you have seen like a lot of talks that happen in the, from the morning in the same track, many of them were like talking about some of the nuances that we need to pay attention to, and that causes a large shift in the way we work ma at a macro scale. And I'm going to end my talk uh, by saying uh, like putting this slide, which is like uh, continuous improvement through continuous feedback. And you can improve at a macro level and micro level when you keep on observing at that, both of them. So this is a good example. So generally, Craig and I work together. And from morning, he asks me a lot of things that he needs. And one of this is very standard. So he says, can you give me a budget for 2020? And my general answer is, I'll give you in some time. 
And he asked five other things, and the same answer repeats. So one day he got frustrated, and then he said, he put an actual Slack bot to whenever I say in, in some time, can you be specific? And every time I type that, it asked me saying that, can you be specific? But it was not a behavior that uh, I am just having. What I understood was like a lot of people in our team, when they were doing it, they were like using the same context because culturally or something like that, few of our people were like having that thing of saying, hey, in something, in some time. And it was not very new for us because we understood what in some time meant or like we could actually put an estimate to it. But when people on remote were doing this, it was like, hey, why are these people saying in some time I don't understand what the some time means? And get, get frustrated. So that's a good example of thinking things at a micro level. I am Ranganathan Balashan Mugam. <laughs> and when I say this, people say, Rangana, what? <laughs> and this happened a lot of times. So people literally butcher my name. <laughs> and so what I did was I put this to check how strong it can be as a password. So that's a, like without any special characters. <laughs> it's a 85% strong password. <laughs> so I added one more character to it, and it became like 100% strong password. <laughs> you can all use this password, but pay some royalty fees to me, or I'll expose your password. <laughs> Call me Ranga. So it's, see, it's like not so complicated. It's like 18% strong. <laughs> the point is, why are we talking about this? A lot of times when you go into, like even in a normal setup, when you're talking with people, the hardest part is un to understand their name. When we don't get the name and we're all having a bare conversation, we generally try to avoid the conversation with this person. Hey, John is so easy to talk to than like calling Ranganathan Balish, what does this mean? So I'll talk to John or like I address it. And there are like a lot of papers which say how people lose opportunities and conversations just because of their name. And this is very, very important. So who, whose problem is this? Is it my problem or is it other people's problem? I always see it from my side because I think you need to build that empathy that people come from different cultures and it will be really hard for them to pronounce this name. And what I always do is I try to help them saying that, hey, pronounce this Ranga and it is very easy. And some of the people like, especially, <laughs> I tried this with a lot of people and all the people in this track, especially Judy, Lisette, Mark, they ask my full name and ask me, help me pronounce this. So when somebody does that, you know that they really know this particular point, and they have already worked with the distributor teams. So that's one uh, real validation of checking how it is important. My journey so far has been interesting. So uh, I graduated as a civil engineer, later on moved to mm, computer science, and then like uh, for 12 years, I've been working as a software engineer, which I told, and almost last 15 years, I've been working with continuously different distributor teams across the globe. And uh, 2016, the story was, uh, the story that I told of like uh, handling 200 people kind of work came through this company and even she got acquired by Oracle. And uh, I came out of uh, Oracle and myself and Craig used to work with a company called Aconex and we both are co-founders of Everest Engineering. So what we do at Everest Engineering is uh, consulting services, software consulting services. And we are like, uh, we started in uh, like one year, four months back. Right now we are 75 people distributed across three different cities and a lot of the team is just, like again, our clients, if you take all of them together, it's quite a distributed team. But the actual developers of our side are also quite distributed between these three cities. And last year, uh, December, I was named like uh, one of the top 10 uh, CTOs in India by CEO Insights Magazine. I really don't know why. <laughs> so one small thing, a request, if you can all stand up, ignore Craig. So a small request that if you can clap for just uh, three seconds. Thank you. Uh, please sit down. <laughs> and thank you for the standing ovation. <laughs> so this is the technique how you can get a standing ovation from a crowd. But that was not the point. How many of you felt it was peer pressure because of which I stood up? Few of you. Ah, like many of you. <laughs> how many of you felt stupid after doing this? A lot of you, yeah. I guess this. <laughs> and how many of you are lying, even if you felt stupid and you are not telling? <laughs> <laughs> the point is, when I went to the conference and I have been seeing the patterns around all these different talks, when people come to the 10th slide, what pe most people try to do is that's the first time they pull out their mobile or like their laptop. I, I know a few people are taking notes, but generally what I'm saying is some people check uh, Slack or like check their WhatsApp and that, that particular thing started happening around 8th or 10th slide, according to my observation. 
So that's why I put this thing uh, at the 10th slide. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very simple, right? According to that uh, particular person who convinced me that you can apply distributed systems uh, theory back to people, it's like this. So you have a task, and you have like a task has like both data and a function. You give it to the system, and then it gives the task completed. You have a task, you give it to people, they finish it and then give it the task completed. Now a big task and give it to a bigger distributed system and the task is completed again. Your big task, your bigger teams, and then the task still gets completed. So let us take uh, like the definition of distributed system. So it says it's a collection of autonomous uh, uh, systems which appear as a single coherent uh, system. Let us do some modification. Remove system with teams. When you apply it, that's exact definition of what a distributed team means. So it is not different. It's exactly we need a set of different teams working together, but we need to see them as a single, like if all the stakeholders see it, it appears like a single team. Let us take characteristics of distributed systems. One of the things is they operate independently, and when they fail, sorry, they operate concurrently, and when they fail, they fail independently, and they don't share a common global clock. If you just change systems to teams, it's exactly the same. There's no change there, except for the global clock is like the time zone. Yeah. But having said all these things, one thing doesn't work. When you actually put a distributed or the teams, it's how people work. It's quite complicated. People have feelings, people have relationship, people are like, uh, I don't like to work with this person. So it's not like as simple as like how you work with systems. So coming back, fundamentals. So there's a coach. He calls out all these boys for coaching. And uh, these people, kids come there. And then they start to coach, but there's no ball. So the kids ask the coach, where is the ball? The coach says, uh, at any point, like how many players are there in a football game? They say 22 players. At any point in time, how many people have the ball? They say like one. Then we are going to do what the remaining 21 people are doing. So let us practice. So fundamentals are really important, which comes down to why do you want to go distributed? So a lot of times it doesn't mean that, hey, somebody else is doing it, our computer are doing it, it's fine. But you really need to know why you are going to do distributed. If you're not clear on that, it's really not worth the effort. I'm giving some examples of answers that I've been hearing from a lot of people. A lot of people say it's cheap. You set up an off development center. But if you go with that mindset, what happens? Then all your decisions are based on how, what is the cheapest uh, set of people that I can hire? And I say cheap by cost, not like by people. Uh, so when you go and say like, hey, this company has like this $30 per hour uh, billing, or like this is the kind of people that I'm going to hire. So if I go by $10 per hour kind of people, then I'll choose $10 per kind of people. The reason being, I'm going by the reason of cheap. So business agreed that economically that is more viable. But a lot of times what happens is, you need going, thinking about the economics is really good, but you need to know how cheap you want to go. And what is the thing that you can compromise on quality or what you can't like get everything at one point. So I have talked with a lot of teams and many times when I talk with those teams, they say that, the biggest point that we have is we went cheap, we, we spent a million, and then we had to put two million to clear off all the tech debts and the things that they have done. So this thing is not a very new answer to me. The next one is like you are hitting hiring limits within your region, and you want to go and hire from some other place. All, that's all good. Uh, remote potential markets. So you see a market here, and then you know there is a market in that particular region or that particular continent, and you want to set up an office because you get both functional content functional context, and also some sales and other uh, uh, departments that you can set up along. So that way, you are going to set up offices there. The other interesting thing a lot of people say is, I'll outsource dirty work. <laughs> what is dirty work? Maybe like a kind of repetitive work that nobody else wants to work, or there's a big monolith system nobody wants to work on that, and it's all only buggy. So you don't have like any very important work every day, but you are just going and checking out for bugs and then fixing it. Now, what happens because of that? If you go with that particular reason, you're going and setting up an office in a different region with a mindset of, hey, these people are good enough to just set up or fix bugs. And once you go with that mindset, your hiring and all other things will get compromised. And eventually what happens is, 
Some of those people will be bright, some of those will not be bright. So you will end up ha having building a company with two different cultural values. And a lot of times it ends up saying that they did this, they did this, so that thing keeps happening. But what is more important is, I really don't like that outsource dirty work kind of thing, but if you want to like outsource something which is functionally not possible here or it's quite expensive here, that's a good reason to go there and then set up a center somewhere else. <coughs> where to go? So we are all clear on like uh, why, and then like the next question is, where do you want to go? I can't just take the map and put two points and say, I have an office here, I want another two offices here and there. It is like not possible. So first thing, you're limited by the number of uh, developers that you want to hire. So over the globe, you are like 2.3 million uh, developers, sorry, 23 million developers. And then you are like, like filtered by these kind of filters. First thing, you need to understand, hey, I'm going, I'm going to distrib distribute it, but because this office is full, I can't find an office nearby, so I'm going to some other uh, office which is close by, or like help other set of people who need not commute from the very far distance within the city. So that's one good reason. Or you want to set up an office, like for example, you are in uh, Melbourne, you want an office in Sydney, that's fine, you're going to set up an office there. Or you're like going out of country because you find some advantages over there, so you go out of the country. Then that puts out a like, lot of a big filter on how many people you can hire. The next one is the availability of uh, developers, and within that competitive pool, how many people are fighting to hire. So that's the other thing. The next most important thing is language. So if you are from German, for example, and then you want, the whole company speaks German within the company, and you want to set up a remote center, and you think they are like, though they only can speak English, we can manage, that's also hard because a lot of times, most of the decision making happens here, and those decisions are not getting translated there. So you need to put that filter of, what is the language, common language across the company, and that becomes a very, very big important filter. And then there's agency versus our own teams. Okay, I don't want to set up an office there, but there's an agency, if I outsource it there, then I get it done for cheaper or like better quality, whatever it is. Then that point is good, but that again filters out a few more things. Then the cost of developers themselves. How costly is getting developers from there versus some other markets? The next most important thing is trusted network of advice. What it means is, hey, I go to this region, I want to set up an office in Bangalore, I am in New York, do I have friends, or like friends of friends, who have already done this kind of thing? And can I rely on their decisions or help where I can rely on their network or help through which I can understand that particular culture and market and set up things? The next one is also ease of travel. A lot of, things, a lot of times we feel that's easy, it's not. Are you comfortable to go there and uh, stay for one month if you're setting up? If you're comfortable, or like you have a team who are like comfortable doing it, that's good. Because at a business level, you take a decision saying that we are going to set up at a place where like your team is not willing to travel. This happens, um, and then that doesn't make sense because you're setting up things from a very remote place. And also getting visas, right, both ways. Like, do they, can they get visas here if they're traveling? Or like, can I get visa there? So these are like kind of a filter map that I'm putting, like, so they're like, uh, this, so, but these maps are like kind of gives a high level overview, but you need not, you cannot rel rely on it because it's not the exits. So if you just zoom in, here if you see Europe is not like a very major player in uh, software developers, but when you actually zoom in, Europe has like a lot of software developers. So what it means is basically you need to check by city rather than by actual region. So you take a country, that's fine, but the whole country is not distributed with software developers. Because they're putting that map, they just distribute it. So you get, 100 people, you are just putting that map on that map rather than you take a particular city and see the capacities on that city. So put city as a better filter than putting the maps. Then this one is what I'm saying. People speak English in different places, and one of the examples that I'm going to give later on, you'll understand what does speaking English in different languages mean. So that's a very important filter. This is a very interesting story. So one day, on the morning, like I was walking very fast in office because things are like broken in production, and there was like a tech lead. So the tech lead said, hey, Ranga, Ranga, and then I just ran to them, and then he's very happy, like he was doing something very busy, and then he, was, he looked very happy. So he said, hey, Ranga, I think uh, I'm very, very excited, so we have a good thing, good news. I said, is, did you find the bug? Is the production fixed? Uh, no, we found something which is very interesting. Then I said, what is it? Then he says, it's, it's not our services, it's their services. <laughs> so, I, so the thing is, basically it's the same company, and then you're saying that it's, 
us versus they. It's not like that. It's we versus us. Like it's all the same thing. I want to ask one question. So I'll come down, and probably I need a volunteer. Or where is the mic? Any mics? Volunteers? Mics? Sorry. Yeah. Do you want me to run with it? Ah, uh, I can come down. Hello. Ah, uh, so anybody randomly? You know do. Uh, so the question is, uh, what is the job of a goalkeeper in football? To prevent people to score. Prevent people to score. What is the job of a go goalkeeper in football? Keep the ball out. Keep the ball out, yeah. So what is happening is this is the same thing on we versus us thing. So what does that mean? So the team thinks if the goalkeeper, or everybody believes in the team, saying that if the goalkeeper can stop the ball, it's success. So what happens if the opponent is hitting, say, 30 goals, and your, uh, foot, your goalie is stopping it, then he's a good goalkeeper, right? Or he stops, like, no, 29 of them, still you get one, and you lose the match. Is it right or wrong? So the job of the goalkeeper, like everybody else, is to win the game. It's not to stop the goals. So then that's what I understood from that lesson, saying that, hey, the whole core value is gone. We are just fundamentally thinking something is right. Something is not right. Because things are failing in production. It's a night for them. They are asked us for help. And what all we did was look around all the things, and then we are very happy because it's not what we broke. So not a good uh, sign. You need to fix that. So first thing, what we started was, I need to be very clear why I'm doing this. Then I have like a set of filters on which I'm looking out, where to go. Then the first and most important thing is us versus there. Because this, like, this part is very, very hard. It appears very simple because some people, if you go, for example, it's cheap, then a lot of people think that, hey, if I make them successful, which means they are cheaper and then they can scale there, I lose my job. So I'm not going to help them. And that kind of mindset comes in. So first thing is build the trust and then make them, make everybody understand we are all one. Otherwise, it's very hard to buy in from people. OK, you have done all these things. The next thing is you're going to hire. So what I'm going to tell you is like, don't hire the best. So you heard it right, you're not hiring the best. What you're actually hiring is hire the right fit. Many a times, I see people coming there and then try to set up an office. They go and find bigger uh, companies, like say Google, Facebook, find a fancy profile there, and try to offer them this job of, hey, You've done this, uh, you're like this, Google some X and Y. Can you come and set up an office for us in Bangalore? They get excited at that point because they don't know. But these people also get excited because I hired somebody with this profile, and they start setting up things. But what happens is it looks like an apple for them because they're they are, they are very, very, uh, maybe they're like very skillful, but that's not like exciting for them enough. So you can't keep them longer happy. So even if you hire the best, they don't stay with you very long. So they will leave very fast. The second thing is, again, don't go for like a, weaker people and give them heavier weights. They will also leave because it will be a lot of pressure for them. A good advice is to see people who are actually buying into your values, which is very, very hard in the beginning. But if you set it right for first four or five people, most of the things will be in place. Next thing. OK, I'm setting up an office there. And say this is on the left is like a perfect uh, uh, model of how I'm going to set up the team. And on the right side is what actually happens. So I'm set, like there are three different uh, distributed teams. And what I'm actually having is the square is the actual values and purpose on which the company works. So you have your own values and purpose. And a lot of times what happens in interviews is, say we are all looking for square face people. I mean, like when I say square face, it's like uh, we are trying to put a shape to it so that it's easy to understand. So you all want, want like a lot of squares because it's easy to scale. They all are agreeing on same values, same purpose. What happens is during interviews, people put who are circle, put a dotted square around, and then they try to act, and then they come in. It happens when you are scaling. Now, that's not wrong. But what happens is, as soon as you let one or few people, the first thing is, because you're building distributed, you have that mindset that if I fire, what will happen? Is there an anxiety that happens? Of course, there is anxiety. But you need to fix it, because if you don't fix it, they're going to scale. Uh, you need to be very transparent on why you are not happy with that person. Try to help them with the goals. And if they don't fit in, they're not squares, ask them to leave eventually. Put up a goal plan. But if you're not firing, you're not definitely going to collapse. Especially, for example, the leadership roles, if they are like simply like the ones who are in the bottom, they are going to hold the whole structure on. And if you hire somebody who's not matching your values, the whole thing is going to 
dance a little bit. Retaining is the hardest part uh, because there's like competitive companies. Now one company saw that you are coming in and setting up a distributor center, you are successful. They try to replicate you because that's the same market and they try to hire similar kind of people or they again try to hire your own people. So how do you retain it? You need to be very clear on how do you retain it. But some of those core things like having a purpose, coaching people, uh, giving them autonomy, all those things really helps. Next most important thing, like so we've, we've gone through this journey and then we came till like, hey, I have done this team and then I have all this uh, uh, team setup done remotely. Now the most important thing I need to work on every day is virtual distance. So this is a concept by a person called Karen. So what Karen, so I have paraphrased it to appear it in a different way. But what she says is, there is a concept of psychological distance with others for collaborative performance. What she's saying is it's limited by three things. One is like the physical distance itself. So you and I uh, can be physically different. The next one is operational distance. And the third one is affinity distance. And I'm going to go one after the other. First one is physical distance. So you have been like through the info queue, right? How many of you said hi to somebody in the lift during the three days? A good number of them. Did you start the conversation there? I think probably I didn't come in any of your lifts because nobody said hi to me. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens is generally we are in the same apartment, same building, or like same workplace. We go in the lift every day. A lot of times we don't even know. We know that they are working in the same office, but we, we are not like connected. There is a physical distance. So that's the actual distance. The other thing is people are coming from different organizations. They are consultants for your office. The problem there is you and them are like, there is like always you and them mm, ideology in mind, it's very hard to remove. The point is there is a distance that gets created because of that. So you need to address that and the time zones, of, of course. But once you're talking about distributed systems, you absolutely have no control on physical distance. So we can ignore that. But also one of the studies says that, like by Karen, says that physical distance is not the major impactor of uh, the actual collaboration performance. Affinity, and op affinity is the topmost uh, impactor. So let us talk what operational distance means. It is the noise in the system. What does noise mean here? The noise is actually, hey, I go for this call because it's distributed, and then do I get a better quality call or is it a poor call, or how do I feel? So those are the operational things that I'm doing distributedly. So how easy is it to do that? That's the operational distance. The next one is affinity distance, and this is the one with highest impact. What it means is how far is the deep relationships within the people in the company. So that's the actual affinity distance. And this one has a lot of impact. Now, so we have come to this point where like we, are, we have been in a journey and now the problem that we are going to solve is how do I reduce this virtual distance altogether? Of which the first thing is really gone. You don't have, you can't work on like physical distance because you already gone distributed. Now I wanted to map cap theorem with this but I don't want to do that because it gets complicated, but you got the concept. So it's, uh, these are things that we are going to talk about, but I just wanted to give you an overview. Uh, I'm going to change the slide because a lot of you are taking pics, but it's, it comes again. <laughs> so there's like some bonus. So let us take first point. Communication is the foundation. Okay. So all of this done right, the first and foremost important thing is communication. So from left to right, uh, how easy is to read the left one? Is it impossible to read the right one? How many of you feel impossible to read the right one? Yeah, it's almost zero, right? I can't even read. So this handwriting of different people on like a similar kind of text. But when we are all online and working together in a collaborative distributed teams, we need not worry about it because all of this comes like this. It's a simple text and we are all collaborating on the same thing. So the, it's, it all comes, converts back into text. But where does the problem come? Because we are not co communicating when we're communicating through chat, it's fine, but still there is like some nuances of a different way of expressing few things in English when you're writing, that's one thing. But apart from that, this is what happens. So this is an actual story. So Craig travels here and then comes to uh, a place like in Bangalore and then he says hi to hi and speaks for few, like few seconds to somebody and then they feel like what's going on and because they don't want to show Hey, just understand from the other side also. Hey, this person is talking to me. I really don't understand. I don't know what to tell. So the best thing I can do is smile. 
But actually, they are not spoiling. Internally, they are feeling really bad. And Craig feels, yeah, I started this conversation. I don't know what to do. So he feels like very awkward. And then ends the, either ends the conversation or takes some. But this is what this did not happen, actually, in the end. So what Craig eventually did was started speaking very slowly, keeping words together, and said hi. So this is the pace in which he started talking, and slowly started increasing the pace. And eventually, both of them started understanding. So the same thing happened. Now, I'll ask you one question. Okay, very simple. Be open. Uh, a person is from England, like from, like say, let us take uh, England. Do they speak better English, or do you take say, a person from India, a particular uh, uh, village in India? Do they speak better English? So uh, we see like people from England. How many people feel that they speak better English than Indian one? Like, like most of you, like others are like, uh, I don't know to tell this, because it's, <laughs> but it's fine. <laughs> so the point is, now I, I change the context. Now what happened there was, Craig is coming from Australia, his, his whole education and his mother tongue is English, but there are like 59 other people who are also speaking English, but they're speaking a different version of English. So what it, it means is they're speaking something like on middle of somewhere, but for when he's speaking even this English, in Austria and other places, it appears like that. So it is contextual. So even if you take like in the crowd, it, it, I'm not telling like they are not like who is speaking good. If I'm coming back to the foundation, because I'm saying communication is the foundation, it means are you communicating really well? Because you chose the language, you need to understand what and how people speak the language. And you need to be helpful for each other on talking English. Yes, like I'm saying. The next thing, I told about the micro expression. This is an actual video. So he is generally like smiling and then talking with the team locally. But on calls, there's a new client, and then they are like going through these calls. And he was always doing this. And I was in the calls, and then observing, I took some pic, and then put a like, square, like small uh, uh, message to him on Slack, saying that, hey, uh, why are you like that? And then I went and had a conversation with him. He said, uh, the first thing is like, when I'm concentrating or focusing something, I just tend to do this. and. Uh, I asked, like, and also he said, uh, because it's the first time I'm going to the new accent, I'm trying to understand, and I'm putting that. Now, what happens is because of this, a lot of people, when they come to the initial calls for a new client, if everybody is like this serious or doing like this, the, the virtual distance is really far. Like, hey, I can't collaborate with them. They're like very serious people. Can I joke? No. Can I answer this? Ah, if, what if I do wrong? So all these things come in, and then we, we create a distance with them, uh, versus if they are close by, we know what kind of person they are and what they are speaking. So, what happened is basically I gave the feedback saying that, hey, you all feel good, watch the video, and then start talking. Feel very comfortable, it's all fine. Then this thing happened. So he's now called Happy Ravindra. So we actually had a Slack logo of him like this, and everybody calls him Happy Ravindra. So this is, what, this is an actual uh, screenshot of the later calls. So if you see even the later uh, photos somewhere, you'll see him always smiling. It is not like ease for people to smile. But I'm, like, I'm not saying like everybody should say that you go and smile or something like that, but I know him personally in offline setting. And then when I saw him in a different behavior, you need to observe and then help them understand that, hey, you're doing a different behavior here. Why is that happening? And then fix that gap. That's how you close that virtual distance. The next most important thing. So how many of you do stand-ups? Oh. So if I tell uh, stop doing stand-ups, how many of you will do? <laughs> One or two. <laughs> He's saying like this. <laughs> Probably if I convince enough. So the point is, we at Everest, we follow something called, like we are again like a, we work with different clients and uh, different time zones. One of the things that we follow very importantly or like uh, religiously is end of the day updates. What it means is, like these are like really random screenshots from different dates, if you can see, from different people. And uh, what we do is like, e if it is a single person or like a team, they definitely put all the status on what they are doing every day. So you can take our Slack and there's a shared channel between us and our clients and you pick any of them Always, it is like this. It's not only from our side, it's from both sides. Say, four people are working from their side, we force them to do it. If they are not, we just keep forcing them till they do it. It's not an, uh, so few things we don't argue, so we just commit to it. So this is something that we agreed on, and the best advantage that we see is, a lot of times, because there's a time, time zone difference, uh, like say, for example, a product person may not be in the, active in the Slack every day, but they really want to know the update at the end of the day. So they come in the early morning, and they are dependent on us, or they want to know like what is the status. They come and see this, and then they're like very comfortable with it, because at their time zone, which is our morning 
three or four, they know what happened. And if, especially if there are blockers, it will go away. So people know that, hey, if I don't fix this, by the time they come in in the morning, this blocker will be there. Or like if it is late evening for them, by the time we are talking to them, it will be hard for them to get it done. So one day lapse will happen. So we saw a lot of advantages over this. So one of the things we do is like return communication in the end. So one of them asked like, hey, we are doing this every day. Do you really need to do stand-ups? We said absolutely yes. Why? Because both of them together form better communication. Why? Because they see this and in the morning, even if you are struggling with your accent or understanding others, you can still understand. Or you miss the stand-up, you still have this thing. So it's a better communication, uh, it's a better way of communicating. The other most important thing is, like a company as, as a whole has only one framework, which is decision making. So why, what are all these titles? I'm VP or like I'm director, I'm CEO, all those things. They're like some roles that you're like, roles and responsibility. Plus the most important thing is who is taking the decision? Who is the final decision maker? That's it. So this one you can adapt, like what I, saw was like when they started building scalable systems, before to scalable systems, what they used to do is the, for the data to be processed, they used to chunk and then do the processing somewhere else and then get it back. But the core logic or like the bottleneck was the single system that was taking the final calculation. But let us take Hadoop for example, Hadoop 1. What they did was, it not only distributes the data, so if it has like 100 GB of data, it splits into like basically based on number of nodes, it splits and gives it back, but also sends back the logic to that. There is a framework on which it operates. It, it doesn't mean that you can put anything in every, everywhere, but within that framework, it can take all the decisions of calculation. So you're giving back the logic. When you're setting teams on distributed uh, uh, style, one of the most important thing is you allow them to take decisions, but give them a framework. What it means is tell them the norms on which they can take. There are like some things which are rules on which nobody can negotiate. Uh, like can I harass here? No, you can't. So <laughs> those are like rules, but there are norms on which you work on. So you can say like, hey, you're going for team lunch. In New York, the team lunch costs, like for example, $50,000, uh, then like a socials, fancy socials. But in India, for example, the similar one, what we understood was, uh, say, $10,000. Then put that norms there, like, so that people know that you have already built that norms, but allow the decision making to happen there. So that's most important. If you keep every decision making here, there is a bottleneck, there is a concept called he headquarters, they didn't approve, then us versus they happens. But if you give back the responsibility and autonomy to the teams distributedly, it all happens. And if it's all within the norms, it's all good. But if anything is deviating from the norms, then they can ask you and then do that particular thing. Choosing right tools, hardware and software, very small uh, uh, activity. So again, like from morning people here are asking people to talk. So just turn around to the people on the right or left for you, whoever is closer. If you have three people, just three of you talk uh, and just Talk to them what is the best tool, just one tool that they are using and why. So I'll give like 30 seconds or like 30 seconds or short, like one minute. So I'm not going to give you like a, a set of tool set, but one thing is the core concept is, if you know Samurais, there's a concept called Daiso. What it means is they carry two swords. One is like a longer one, the other one is shorter one. Why do they carry the shorter one? Because if it is a closed space or a room where they are fighting, they can't swing it enough. So they have the shorter ones, which are daggers, then they use it. So you try to use right tools for right things. Don't stick to tools that are like not good enough. And uh, if you take, like this was a random meeting and then I just took a screenshot, like this, some of the things that have been Judy and others were telling in the morning are like kind of followed. But if you see somebody, like one of the person there is not like uh, using their video because he was in hospital and he clearly communicated that. The point is basically as much as possible, we try to follow this. Then other important thing, when you're like distributor, there is, a, like, uh, there is a collaboration time and concentration time. Why? Because you're always dependent on the other team. And if you keep on talking on meetings and then keeping on co collaborating, it doesn't help. The other most important thing is after your workers, if you keep on getting pings, there are two problems. One is you have the nudge of like, hey, I'm not responding to them. The other thing is uh, if you end up responding to them, then you're like not having a very good family life. So you're just talking work with your spouse always. And what happens? A lot of beer happens. So basically try to, from the beginning, be very clear saying that you can have your own framework. Like say that, hey, we are going to put all the questions there, but after six, don't even hesitate to respond. Like, like sorry, don't even worry about uh, not responding at all. We don't even care about it. 
Whenever you come back, respond it, but we are putting it because we don't want to miss the actual conversation. So there is a, uh, there is a uh, architect called uh, Mattie Ferroni. So what uh, he did was, he, he was in relationship with an, uh, it's a place called Mali in Africa, and he was in relationship with a singer in Mali. So he had this idea of, I'll go there and build an open air theater for them. So that was the idea, but once he went there, the first thing that stroke to him was like, hey, this culture is completely different. People, were, the, the mornings are like super hot and nobody was actually awake in the mornings. Everybody was sleeping in the mornings and they were working in the nights. That was like first cultural shock. The second thing he observed was, a lot of them were using kerosene and uh, like other similar kind of uh, flashlights, which were like dangerous because that was uh, carried along for different activities. And if you just see the whole night, they were just using that. The third one was, it was not like people could, were not owning property. It was the community or the social structure owning the property. And nobody had like, I own this kind of thing. Which means with this in three con constraint, the problem that he found was, what if I build a lamppost? And so if you understand like he can't build a lamppost and keep it there if individual people are owning it because people can steal it. So based on these constraints, once he understood that locally, this is the final model that he came up with. And it's actually live, like people are using it right now the whole. And this happened in 2010. So the point that I'm trying to make is you can't take something that is successful in New York or like SFO and then try to just replicate. You want to replicate in Bangalore or some other place. You can't do that. It's really hard. You need to go there, try to understand the local things and allow the local decisions first. Hey, locally this happens like this. I try to understand that and then try it in the local way first and then later on try add things that are better from there. So this is uh, an interesting thing. So there's like a concept of local leader who is the conductor, who is very, very important role uh, in a particular company. So I used to work with a company which was US based and uh, uh, I was working as a like, remote team in another city in India. What happened was this guy was like a real uh, micromanager, the office uh, manager. So what he used to do is he used to have like a particular style. If you're in meetings, generally if you're in meeting with my own team, then it's fine. But if sometimes like say some other person comes and asks me some doubt and we go into meeting room, he asks this particular style of like, hey, and he just peeps into the meeting room and then asks like, what are you doing? And this used to happen like very frequently at like, I, I left the company within a month, but what happened was like one of the, one of the days when I was like having a serious meeting with somebody, he came in and asked like, well, what are you talking about? So I got so pissed off that I told him that we are tossing a coin so that we choose who is going to win and go to the restroom first. And then I resigned the same day. So it was like so frustrating for us because the conductor is the one who is the cultural catalyst. And if you choose them right, your culture will be replicated there right. If you're choosing them wrong, the culture stays there long and all the people who, you can't change that particular person very fast. Even if you change, the culture that he has built will not change very easily. So there's a big change management that needs to happen. So choose the right leader, and that's the hardest part of the whole thing. The last thing that I want to talk about is like promote online chit chats. So when we are like in offline office, this is like our actual few set of people. We used to go together for lunches and tea and coffee. And what happens is this water cooler conversations, right? We don't talk about work like, hey, yesterday I had this, this thing happened, or like something is going on. So I know them really well. Like if they are not performing for those two days, I know that they are like, a, uh, having a late evening stay because their spouse is unwell and they're taking care of the spouse, so they're like not sleeping well. So then once I understand all these uh, smaller nuances of them, then the actual uh, affinity distance that I talked about is very, very small. So that becomes like very easy for people to work with. When I come on the, like, the right, when we are like distributed, this thing generally doesn't happen. So whenever we set up a new team or like a new distributor team, the first thing that we do is like, because we work with different clients, a one hour meeting of just chit chat. It is like focus to chit chat, nothing else. You, the most of the time what happens is like you set up a meeting and the, there's a serious business thing. Hey, we are going to do this. This is the task. This is what we are going to do. That's not how actual teams work. Like when you come into an office, you just uh, have this high, then you go for chai, talk to people, then you're like very comfortable. So that's what we are trying to do. And if like at frequent intervals, then there's like a meeting which is more than one hour, then the first 10 minutes is like, reserved for chit chats, so like people say like what's happening in their life and then it becomes like we saw like a considerable amount of imp improvements. You can't measure that, but once you try uh, applying it, you'll see a lot of value in that. And this is like one good example, right? Like we're working with the, uh, like a different team and they're showing like uh, how they, uh, their local things that they're showing up. 
And you can see happy Ravindra there, like he's still smiling. <laughs> and all of these things, so there's a bonus point, is you, you cannot do any, like if you start thinking that it's working fine, it's actually not. You need to completely work, work and receive feedback and keep on continuously improving. So one thing we see, always say at Everest Engineering, like in all, all hands and any, every other place, is we know this is the best way to do something. If anybody knows a better way of doing this, then we'll do that. But because we don't know, we are trying to do this. In summary, so we started with like why we want to do it. Then we said like we versus us, we don't want to do that. And from there, we understood where do we want to go. Then we started hiring a team, firing, and we talked about uh, retention. Then we took the concept of virtual distance and started working on how to reduce the virtual distance. And from there, these are the takeaways. So basically, these are like the ways in which we try to get the virtual distance uh, lesser. And this is the last story that I want to end up with. So this is a story called, like, uh, Napoleon was like very powerful and uh, was uh, winning a lot of wars. So he was quite confident that he's going to win Russia. So he took 100,000 soldiers and went into Russia directly. And what they didn't understand was they basically lost most of the army. And then they came, like, they lost the war also. And then they came back. So one of the theories, I don't know if it is true, but a lot of documentary is there, which says that is, they used to wear, uh, like Russia is super cold at that time, and uh, they used to wear uh, tin buttons. And when they went to that temperature, all these tin buttons crushed into powder. So they, didn't, they had to close their uh, uh, cloths and then protect them from cold and also fight the war. So that's the reason they lost the war. So most important thing is, if you're trying to do something from remote, it doesn't work. Even if you're like as big as the Napoleon army, you need to understand all these things before starting anything. So that's it. If you have any questions, I'm good to go. Judy, we have time for questions. We've got time for one or two questions. Oh, okay. Thanks. Does anyone have a question? What do you do to uh, deal with the cultural differences when you have a new client? What's, the, what's, what's some of the ways that you introduce? So one of the culture? photos that you saw was like a team in Australia. And they were telling some things about their culture in the first chit chat session. So they talked about that uh, dingri do, or like, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's like that long, uh, 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 long instrument that they use in this aborgi culture. And they started explaining about it. But that doesn't help like uh, understand the whole culture and the way they work. It's like very frequent chats, but also like setting up the initial framework. Okay, we work on these norms. First, we ask them like, what are the norms on which you are working? And that's first thing like to understand the clients in which they work. And then we say, this is the way in which we work, and this is our experience, and come to a common ground on which we work. But apart from that, uh, a completely new culture, for example, it, it doesn't happen in day one. We have to continuously put some effort. So we have like some people who are like customer success, uh, not like the actual customer success, but general customer success people, who keep on talking with the clients and then uh, uh, like in bi-weekly basis, and keep taking the feedback and keep applying it back. So that's how we improve. And that's actually time. Sure. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. <laughs>